welcome to the next lecture of uh, our course multi core computer architecture storage and interconnection our discussion on the last lecture was about the basic organization of dram module and we have seen what is the role of dram and how it is internally organized with the various hierarchy right from channels to dims all the way up to rows and columns today we will see one of the important aspect with respect to dram design that is about address mapping that means once you have an address how will you find that whether this address is under which channel or it belongs to which rank or bank etc and the other component very crucial component that drives the entire dram is the dram controller it is the one that generates appropriate control signals for the dram to work so once this controller receives the input from the processor side or from the last level cache controller it has to generate appropriate control signals such that dram will work accordingly and retrieve the data so today our focus will be on dram controllers and address mapping we have already seen that the dram subsystem consists of channels which are basically data buses so if you have multiple channels you have more number of connecting points from the dram to the the processor and then we have multiple dims are there each channel can consist of multiple dims and dims are further subdivided into one or two ranks and ranks will be consisting of many chips chips consists of multiple banks that is arranged in a 3d fashion and each bank we have its own row buffer and bank is organized as rows and columns so we have seen that once you give a row address the contents of the entire row is getting transferred to the row buffer and then you give the column address and uh, mention what kind of operation whether it's a read operation or a write operation that you are going to carry out on this dram this diagram is also familiar to us we have seen that a dram rank is uh, a unit wherein common address and commands are been given and uh, different chips are going to return with uh, different sub units of a given data so altogether if it's 64 bit data bus 8 bit each is given and we have seen the bank structure it's the 3d structure that is going to to organize your data stack wise and you have a row buffer which is there in each bank so the contents of a row get transferred to this row buffer now we will see about a basic dram operation when a dram is required we know that in order to carry out the instruction execution with the help of an instruction pipeline during the fetch stage itself we will contact the cache memory and multiple levels of caches are there if the required instruction or data is not available even in the last level cache then we require the help of a dram so cpu essentially the processor chip which houses the processor as well as the caches has to communicate and that communication is done to the dram controller so there is a transfer time that is involved that's from the cpu chip on to the controller is the dram controller transfer time and the controller itself has its own latency there are some kind of an operation that happens in the controller and that has to be carried out now what are the important components or important operation that we do many requests will come to the controller because we are now already in multi core environment so you can have requests coming from multiple tiles or multiple processors and all these things is going to queue up inside the dram controller and see so how the queuing delay and then you have to pick one among them that's called the scheduling delay that happens at the controller and whatever command you have to generate so once you identify a particular request is going to be service that from among many request that comes to the dram controller we have to queue it up and from the queue you have to pick one that is called a scheduling operation once the scheduling is done let's say request number r1 is to be serviced first then this request r1 has to be converted into a couple of basic commands once the commands are there then from controller you are passing to the dram so dram is outside the controller in all modern day processors the controller is either on the chipset that we have seen the north bridge chipset or the controller can be on the processor itself 
So, once the controller is communicated, controller picks up what is the request that is to be serviced, appropriate commands are generated, these commands will flow from controller on to the DRAM and that is propagated through the bus and that is what is called the bus latency that is going to come. So, now the request have reached the DRAM unit, the DIM and there we have to split the address as column address and row address. So, now we have different cases. If the row is already open, then only a column address row is required. That means, already in the row buffer, we have the contents of the particular row which we are talking about is available. We call it as an open row scenario. If it is an open row scenario, then we need to give only the column address. Now, if it is already pre-charged, that means already it is a closed row, then you have to give a row address stroke followed by a column address stroke. So, RAS and CAS has to be given one after another with appropriate timing gap between them. The other one is called the row conflict, some other row is already opened. So, we have to close that row that is been done using a pre-charge command. So, there is a pre-charge command that goes. After the pre-charge command, we have to give the row address stroke and column address stroke. The first one will take very less amount of time. The second one will take little bit more amount of time because there is a raw address stop that is involved and the third one it involves a pre-charging operation followed by a raw address stop and a column address stop. So, this DRAM bank latency is involved, it is a varying number, it depends on whether it is an open row, whether it is a closed row or whether it is a raw conflict. Once the DRAM has returned the data, now the data has to go back to the controller and that involves the bus latency and once the data reaches controller, the controller is going to transfer it to CPU or to the last level cache. Now, we will see when can you parallelize things, when you get multiple requests that is going to come to you or essentially to the DRAM, how are you going to parallelize things. So, one method is using multiple banks, we have already seen that every rank is divided into multiple banks that is in a three dimensional layered structure. Now, each of these bank has its own row buffer. So, when you have multiple banks, it enable concurrent DRAM access, bits in the address determine which bank it resides. So, if you have data that is available in multiple banks, you can keep all the data ready in the row buffer and give the column address strobe in such a way with appropriate timing delay such that bank 1 data is transferred. By the time data transfer is over, give the corresponding column address for the next bank such that the data from adjacent banks or different banks can be sent one after another. We have to understand that when we have multiple banks, we cannot work them parallelly if you have only one data bus that is connecting. So, if multiple banks are connected to the same data bus, give the control signals in such a way that once the data is transferring through the data bus, the data of the next bank should be kept ready such that whenever you look into data bus, always it carries data. They may not be given by the same bank, they may be given by varying banks or different bank numbers. And we know that for transferring of data, you require some row address to be given so that data will reach the row buffer followed by the column address to be given. So, this row address and the column address has to be given accordingly such that data bus is never idle. But if you are going to do all the proper all the operation in a single bank itself, then after one operation, let us say the next address that you want, if it is in a different row, then you have to write it back, but pre-charge it, then give a new row address followed by the column address. So, you have bank level parallelism will essentially help you if you want certain data to have to reach the processor in adjacent clock cycles, it is always better to put them into appropriate banks. So, they, they should not be put in the same bank. So, in this way, the, the, the addressing mechanism or the address bits has to be given in such a way such that they are into adjacent banks. Similarly, another set of parallelism happens when you have multiple independent channels. Like already mentioned, channel is the communication point through which a DRAM uh, communicates with the controller. So, when you have multiple channels, it is essentially you have multiple set of buses. So, this provides fully parallel and they have separate data buses, this will increase bandwidth and 
you have to essentially use more wires and more area issue are there and moreover more pin issues are also there. Now, when you deal with this band conflict and channel conflict, so what are essentially conflicts? Two addresses are coming. Let us say these two address belong to the same channel. So, even though you have a multi channel DRAM system, if the address, if the incoming address to the DRAM controller is in a pattern such that both address belong to the same channel, then they can be transferred to DRAM or DRAM can access this location only one after another because they belong to same channel. Likewise, if the addresses are in such a way that if these two addresses are mapped to different channels, then DRAM could fetch these the content of these addresses parallelly. So, the problem of two address mapping into the same channel is known as channel conflict and two address mapping into the same bank is known as bank conflict. Now, we have multiple banks to reduce the delay. How this is possible? So, consider this case where the timing diagram is given. Let us say I am going to give an address. This address will reach the DRAM. DRAM has to perform some raw address and other thing. At the end of this operation, it is going to give you the data. Let us say you are going to give another address. It takes lot of time because the same thing you have to uh, pre-charge pre or raw address strobe or column address strobe and then data D1. D1 corresponds to data of A1 and D0 corresponds to data of A0. Similarly, you have an A2 which will give you the data D2. We can see that after the address is given, it has some amount of time delay in returning the data. This is basically the controller latency or the queuing delay that is associated, the scheduling delay, the bus transfer time and the time to give the raw address strobe, column address strobe and the pre-charge signals. Let us assume that the address A1, A2, A3 or A0, A1, A2 in this case, let us say they all are mapped to different banks. So, we give the addresses one after another A1, A2, A3 whatever and each address will have its own time delay. So, it will take some time so that you will get D0, but since they are all belonging to different different banks, by the time D0 is getting transferred, the next bank can be ready with the corresponding data. So, you get an overlapped access that is the delay of each of these is overlapped and if there is no bank conflict, if there is no bank conflict means all these should be mapped to different banks. So, once you start data transfer, then without any delay, all other data transfers are happening. So, essentially what we have learned from this, for each of the address, once the address is given, this address involves processing at different levels. At first stage, in the DRAM controller, there is a queuing and a scheduling delay and once the scheduling is done, once your address has been picked for service, then it has to be converted to appropriate commands and these commands has to flow from the DRAM controller to reach the DRAM system or basically the DRAM unit to the bus. So, there it involves a bus latency. Now, once it reaches the corresponding DRAM unit, depending on whether it is an open row or a closed row or a row conflict, appropriate signals like pre-charge, row address strobe or column address strobe has to be generated. Once you get this, then the data is ready, again transfer through the bus to reach the DRAM controller. So, it takes some amount of time after the address is given, it takes some amount of time for this address to be processed and the appropriate data is being retrieved back. And again, if you give the next address after that, again the same amount of delay is there. So, for every address given, there is a delay. The question is, if the addresses are mapped to different banks, can I overlap the delay? That is exactly what is happening in this case. For each address, there is a delay, but since the delays are overlapped, the idea is overlapping. Since the address, since the delay associated with this address is overlapping, we could get a pipeline to transfer of data. Once, so the timing of the signals should be in such a way that by the time D0 reaches back the controller, D1 should be ready to transfer. So by the time D1 is reaching the other side of uh, uh, the transmission, D2 should be ready. So, the appropriate signals which generates D0, D1, D2 and D3, the corresponding data from the raw buffer has to be carefully timed. So, under this context, the timing parameter associated with DRAM is a very crucial design issue. Now, let us try to see how address mapping is done. Consider the case, we have a single channel 
let us say we have an 8 byte memory bus. That means, the memory can transfer 64 bits of information, that is why it is called an 8 byte memory bus and you have a 2 GB memory which is consisting of 16 K rows and 2 K columns per bank and you have 8 banks in total. Since it is 2 GB, the total address bits would be 31 bits and you can have different types of interleaving. First one is called row interleaving. So, what do you mean by row interleaving? Consecutive rows of memory is kept in consecutive banks. So, when you have one full row, when you move to the next row, the next row is not part. For example, row number 210, 210 is in bank 0, 211 will be in bank 1, 212 is in bank 2. So, when you have a couple of requests which are to adjacent rows, these are not stored in or the addresses are mapped in such a way that they are not stored in the same bank. Row number 210 will be in this bank, row number 211 will be in the next bank. So, when you have a big copy of data where the data is scattered across 210 and 11, if they are belonging to different bank, by the time the transfer is over in 210, 211th data can be kept ready. So, access to consecutive cache blocks are serviced basically in the pipeline manner. So, you can see this out of the 2 GB that you have, we have the 8 byte memory bus. So, the last 3 bits will tell byte in the bus and we have seen the 2 K columns. So, 11 bits are given to the column and once this 11 bits, all permutations of this 11 bits are over, now we are moving to next row. And we have seen that consecutive rows are belonging to consecutive banks. So, once the column bit is over, the next 3 bits, we have total of 8 banks. So, the next 3 bit is coming for the banks and then we have the rows that is coming. So, in short, the bank bits will come between the row bits and the column bits. This is called row interleaving. So, once all the column bits are been given, when we are moving into the next row, the bank bits will come over there. Yet another kind of interleaving is called cache block interleaving. What is the significance of cache block interleaving? We know that it is a last level cache that is going to request to the DRAM to give a block of data. So, any data that moves from DRAM is to the processor chip, especially to the last level cache. So, it is not that one word that you want, you wanted to transfer an entire cache block to the last level cache from the DRAM controller. And once that is given, once CPU is going to fetch from those cache block, now immediately you require the next cache blocks. So, once you transfer a block of cache from the DRAM, in the near future the next block will be of demand. So, can I keep the adjacent cache block data in adjacent banks? So, consecutive cache blocks addresses is stored in consecutive bank, let us say you have 64 byte cache block, access to consecutive cache blocks should be done in parallel. So, this is the way how it is been done. So, when you have cache block interleaving, you will still use the last 3 bit belong to bus because you are having an 8 byte memory bus. Your column byte to bit was 11. Now, we know that how much bits are required to generate the data that is correspond to one cache block. Our cache block is 64 bytes. So, we require total of 6 bits, combination of 6 bits starting from 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 to 6 ones, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. This is 6 bits are there, you get 2 power 6 combination and that is what your 64 bytes. So, the lower order 6 bits will determine the contents of a cache block. So, the next one, so these things will go to one cache block. The next, very next address is next cache block. Can I put banking there? That is why bank bits come after the last 6 bits. Why last bits? Because you have a 64 byte cache and 64 byte correspond to 2 power 6. So, least significant 2 power 6 bits are there. After that, you use the bank bits and then which is followed by the remaining column bits. We know that the column bit is 11 out of which 3 is used, the next 8 is been given. So, what happens in cache block interleaving is 
out of the total column bits you are going to fragment the column bits and insert the bank bits inside this. So, depending on your requirement let us say you want raw interleaving use the address mapping accordingly. So, the DRAM controller can play this a bit of intelligence on it and give the addresses in such a way that will suit our requirement. So, if raw interleaving is needed then bank bits should be kept in between the row address bits and the column address bits. If cash block interleaving is required then you have to split the column bits you have a lower order column bits and a higher order column bits. The least significant n bits where 2 power n is going to be your cash block size the least significant n bits are being removed and the bank bits will come just after the least significant n bits. So, this is basically the address mapping in a single channel. Now, let us see address mapping in multiple channels. So, when you have multiple channels let us say you have 4 channels. So, 2 bits in the physical address they are going to take a call whether it belong to channel 0, channel 1, channel 2 and channel 3. So, we can see that if the most significant bits are been used for channels then after this by it column banks and all you have this channel also that is going to come. Now, I can keep in such a way that channel bits can be kept after the column and bank bits. We can also keep channels in between banks and column bits or this the last design where adjacent words are kept in address and channel. So, once the channel bit is located between column bits and the byte in the bus bits the last case this means adjacent memory words are kept. So, your word number 0 is from channel 1, word number 2 sorry word number 1 is from channel 2, word number 2 is from the next channel that is why if the channel bits is put immediately after the bus. Now, once you go to columns then the next column so you have done with all the column bits the next row is going to be in adjacent channel, next bank is going to be in adjacent channel, next the most significant case wherein the, uh, the entire system is divided into uh, multiple channels and the peculiarity is adjacent locations are kept in the same channel. So, the first 1 by n portion will be in one channel next to 1 by n is going to be in other channel. Now, along with this if you have wanted cash block interleaving how will you do? Here also you can see that for a 64 byte cash blocks you can see the banking bits are still there. So, the lower order bits we have seen it already now in between the channel bits can be added if cash block interleaving is to be applied. So, raw interleaving and cash block interleaving are the two common method of uh, using this banking and depending on whether it is a single channel or multi channel appropriate channel bits also has to be given. Now, let us try to understand a very important concept which is very much needed while designing of the DRAM system. We know that our processors are going to generate virtual address and using memory management unit you convert this virtual address into physical address. Physical address is the address of the location when it is residing inside main memory. Now, main memory is what we deal as DRAM. Now, while you give address it is operating system that gives the address via a page table or a memory management unit. So, when you translate an address from a virtual address to physical address whatever frame number you give that has a significant say whether banking will happen or interleaving will happen. Consider the case you have a virtual address so the operating system in short can influence where an address maps into a DRAM. So, you are giving a virtual page number and using a translation lookaside buffer or a page table virtual page number is converted to physical frame number. So, you consider this case you have 19 plus 12 that is total of 31 you are how going to have a 2 GB of RAM that is why it is 31 19 plus 12 it is 31 bits. So, from among 64 bit virtual address you are going to convert into 31 bit virtual address. So, essentially it is this 31 bits that consists of your frame and the offset is to be divided into byte in bus, column bits, bank bits and row bits. So, whatever physical frame number you have total of 2 power 19 frames that is why you use 19 bits for frame number. So, when somebody is requesting for a physical address that means you are going to assign a physical address for an incoming virtual address the 19 bit physical frame number that you give 
will take a call what is a bank number. Let us consider that a program is always running parallel with some other program. Let us say A and B are two programs. Now, A is already residing. Now, you are going to load program B from secondary memory into main memory. What will be the address that you give to B? You do not want a conflict. You do not want a bank conflict between A and B because condensed from program A and condensed from program B has to be fetched more or less at the same time. They are co-running programs or concurrently running programs. So, when you assign the physical address to B, the bank number that you give to the physical address of B should be different from the bank number of the physical address of A. Assume that I have given a bank as 0 to A. So, when I give it to B, B should not be given a bank address of 0 and how will I know bank? You have to give that frame number such that these 3 bits are not equal to 0. When those 3 bits of the frame number is equal to 0, 0, 0, then program A and program B is going to have a banking level conflict. So, how it is being done? Operating system can influence which bank or channel or a rank a virtual page number is mapped to. It can perform page coloring to minimize bank conflict or to minimize inter application interference. So, if you know certain applications are going to interfere each other, if you want them to be either in the same bank or in the different bank, the moment you give the virtual page number to physical frame number translation, it is during the address assignment operation you have to take care of this. So, operating system has a big role to play. The underlying physical organization of the main memory has to be connected with the operations inside uh, the DRAM. So, we have completed the address mapping. Now, we will see what are the functions of a DRAM controller. The DRAM controller does many functions. First one is it has to ensure correct operation of the DRAM like address mapping, refreshing and timing. The service DRAM request, whatever request is coming to the DRAM, the DRAM controller has to service them by using the appropriate scheduling principles. You have a lot of constraints you will get like the resource conflict, sometimes the request will be to the same bank, sometimes it may be to the same channel, sometimes you have to make use of the bus. So, you have to minimize the delays and whatever request you get, you have to translate these requests into command sequences that the DRAM device can understand. We have to buffer these requests and from the buffered request like called queuing, you have to pick up certain requests that is called scheduling, schedule the request. And sometimes once you get multiple requests, which one to pick that is called DRAM scheduling. Scheduling is also an important operation. Sometimes you may have to reorder uh, the service that you get, reordering, row buffer management, bus management, rank management are there. And above all, we have something like management of power and thermal aspects of DRAM. The DRAM is going to consume power. So, if I schedule in certain way, then probably I could get a better power efficiency. That is done with the help of turning off, of turning off certain DRAM chips or moving into certain specific modes in DRAM. So, there is a design choice which is not there now, but a couple of years before there was a design choice where should I keep the DRAM controller? It can be placed on the chipset that is on the motherboard. So, it, there is more flexibility like if you use a different motherboard, you can use a different DRAM controller because processor and motherboard are two separate entities. So, if I wanted to use a different DRAM controller, you could always house this processor in a different set of chipset. So, more flexibility you have to plug in different DRAM types into the same system. And especially it is less power density in the CPU chip. Since DRAM controller is not part of CPU, CPU chip and DRAM controller is part of the chipset, the motherboard, it uh, will uh, to reduce power consumption inside CPU. But nowadays it is preferred that since there are a lot of transistors available inside the CPU, DRAM controllers can be kept on the CPU chip as well. This will reduce the latency for main memory access because it is inside the chip, higher bandwidth between cores and controller and CPU and the controller can co mo talk more frequently that means more amount of data can be exchanged between the CPU and controller when they both are located inside the CPU. This is a logical view of the DRAM controller. You can see that CPU and I O devices are going to give the request and this, this is the DRAM memory controller. You have various banks. So, request to various banks how to be signaled, appropriate address translation. So, you have different request that is coming. You perform the address translation. Once you perform the address translation, you will come to know whether these requests belong to bank 0, bank 1 and all 
and to each bank you are going to put up into a queue and then you have the scheduling out of the many requests that comes to bank 0 which is the one that is to be picked and then you have the signaling interface which will essentially work with your DRAM. So, this is the logical view of the DRAM controller. We can see that when you have multiple caches, multiple last level cache, all these are going to give you request and then you have, you have each of these banks. So, this request will go to the appropriate banks and then there is a scheduling is there and scheduler will pick and uh, activate uh, the necessary banks. Now, what are the different DRAM scheduling policies? So, what is essentially scheduling? When you have multiple requests that is coming, from the multiple request, can you pick one? Where this picking is a process is called scheduling. Now, what are the parameters by which I pick that is important? The simplest one is when you get multiple requests, pick the one who reaches the DRAM queue first, first come first serve, FCFS scheduling. So, oldest request fleet is given preference. The second one is called as FRFCFS, first ready, first come first serve. So, what you do here is you know that you are going to activate a data by giving a column number so that the contents of the entire row will come to a row buffer and then you give the column address such that the data can be extracted. Now, if the next request is also to an already open row, then again row address need not be given because the row is already present in the row buffer. So, just give only column address. So, if you can give all requests who are row hits, that means their contents are already present in the row, then it is very easy so that there is not much delay that is involved. So, the idea is very simple. Once you get many requests, find out from this set of requests which of these requests is to an already opened row. That is the row is already ready. So, first serve is those requests which are part of an already opened row that is known as first ready and between them you can use first come first serve. So, raw hit is serviced first and then only we are going for oldest hit. So, certain packets or certain requests that are coming to DRAM controller which are actually part of some different row may not get service. So, the oldest request may not be part of a currently opened row. So, in that case oldest one may not be preferred. A later request, a request which comes just recently, but if that is a raw hit, we can prioritize that. Such a kind of a scheduling policy is known as FRFCFS. This will surely maximize DRAM throughput because rather than writing and then loading it again, already you can use those one which are part of row hits. And scheduling is basically done at the command level. We know that for you have to give once the scheduling is done and the appropriate commands are also been passed. Column commands are always prioritized over row commands because whenever there is a chance that we can give only column commands we should give that because once you give the row command then the appropriate row has to come down to the row buffer and then only we can give the column commands. Within each group older commands are prioritized over the younger ones. Continuing with the policy, a scheduling policy is essentially a prioritizing order and what are the method by which you can prioritize? You can look at the age of the different request that is coming. You can look whether from among the request some of them will be raw hits, some of them will be raw miss. You can see the request to DRAM will be coming from a cache controller. So, whether it is a prefetch request or a read request or a write request, some are load misses, some are store misses, some are the requests coming from GPU, some are coming from CPU, some are coming from DMA controller. So, there also you can use some priority. And you have to look into how much critical is this request. How many of the instructions are actually dependent on this particular DRAM request? If I service this request early, how many instructions are going to get benefited? Is the processor still stalling? So, since you work in multi core processors, many processors, many caches are there. From the caches, there is a possibility that multiple requests will come to the DRAM controller. Once you get multiple requests coming to the DRAM controller, how are you going to pick them? And this picking can be based upon age, raw buffer hit or miss status, whether it is a prefetch operation or a read or write operation whether it is a load or a storm is 
or who is going to give the request? Let us say it is a CPU, DMA or GPU and the criticality of the request. Sometimes the interference caused by these requests are also being considered in order to take the final call. Now, order for management policies. Here we are going to deal with there is a case like we have an open draw. So, when you get a request and you find from the address translation in such a way that the row number of the incoming request is same as that of the row number of the currently activated row. That scenario is known as open row. So, if you use open row policy that means even after servicing a request you are not going to close the row. You assume that the next request or you, you feel that or the, you, the probability that the next request also is belonging to the same row is very high. In short, when we work with open row policy, after accessing a row, the row is kept open, hoping that the next request also will be to the same row. If the next request happen to be to the same row, then this row address drop is not required, already it is an open row, just to give column address and get things done easily. So, next access might need the same row. So, if the next access is to the same row, that is known as a row hit. If the next access by chance, unfortunately, if it is to a different row, it is a row conflict, at that time I have to pre-charge, then I have to apply a row address strobe and then I have to apply the column address strobe. The second policy is known as closed row policy. In the case of a closed row policy, what we do is close the row after the access. So, for every access, we close the row by applying a pre-charge signal. So, once you use a pre-charge signal, the contents of row buffer are transferred back to the row, hoping that the next request will be to a different row. If the next request is to a different row, already I have done the pre-charging, so only row activation is required. So, close the row after an access if no other request is already there in the request buffer. Here there is one tricky portion is, after accessing of a row, the contents of the row by giving an appropriate command. Now, if you have an address, you look into the row buffer and transfer the data. After transferring of the data, you look into the DRAM queue whether there are any requests to the same row. If so, service them. If there are no other request to the same row or the queue is empty, kindly pre-charge it. If you pre-charge it, now pre-charging is over, row buffer is empty. So, any request that comes in future, you have to surely give a row address. So, next access might be needing a different row, so you avoid a row conflict, it is, it is just like a row empty case. If the next access is to a same row, then you have to again activate it. This is the basic difference between an open row policy and a closed row policy. Open row policy believes that the next request will be to the same row, so if that is the case, then it become a row hit. If it is to a different row, then we have to pre-charge it, then row address strobe and column address strobe. Coming into closed row policy, the concept of closed row policy is, in, is like this. We assume that the next request is not to the same row. If it is not to same row, it will surely a row conflict, so you have to pre-charge at that time. We pre-charge it now itself. We are not waiting for the next request to come. Prior to the next request, we pre-charge it already. If you pre-charge it, whenever it is as good as like row is empty now, for every new request that is coming, you have to activate the row. And nowadays we use adaptive policy, certain applications may be open row friendly, some other applications may be closed row friendly or in the same application, certain time phases may be up to 1 lakh cycles, open row policy may be good and after 1 lakh cycles, closed row policy may be good. So, depending on the application's requirement, you have to understand what kind of uh, policy will suit them. So, nowadays there are research work which look into the profile of the application and from the profile of application see whether open draw policy is suitable or closed draw policy is suitable. So, we can see there is a mere comparison between open and closed row policies. Let us say you are using an open draw policy, the first access is to row 0. Let us say the next access is also to row 0, since it is an open draw policy, it will be always a read, you have only just to give the read command, it is kept open. If the first axis is to row 0 and second axis is to row 1, it is a row conflict. So, you have to pre-charge first, activate row 1, 
and then only you can read. Now assume you are using a closed row policy, let us say the first axis is to row 0, next axis is also to row 0, axis in request buffer. So if this next axis is already present in the row buffer, so by the time the first axis is over, when you look at the queue, you see that there is somebody there and he is also to row 0, just read. If at that time the queue is not having that one, then we will close it. So if it is closed, you have to activate row 0 again. That means when the first axis is to row 0, the contents are extracted. After extraction, when you look into the buffer, the buffer does not have any more request. That means the second request is not buffered till then. So then the row is closed. After closing only, we will get the new request. In that case, you have to activate the row and then read. Once reading is over, at the end you have to do a pre-charge. The third case is in the closed row policy, the first axis is to row 0, the contents are retrieved. The next axis is to row 1. So you have to activate row 1, read at the end of the operation it is pre-charge. So pre-charge happens after every axis. Now we need know that since the DRAM is making use of capacitors and capacitor has a leakage property. If you read from the capacitor, it will lose the charge. Even if you are not reading, it will still lose the charge. Maybe it may take a little bit more time. That is what is known as the leakage property of the capacitor. So we will see what DRAM refresh is. DRAM capacitor charge leaks over time. The memory controller needs to read each row periodically to restore the charge. So what is the idea of refreshing? You have many rows. Let us say you have 10 rows. You activate row number 1. So the contents of row number 1 will come down to row buffer. Then you pre-charge it, so it is stored back. So it is a sequence of activate it, the row contents will reach row buffer, pre-charge it back, it will goes back to the row buffer. Take the next row, activate, pre-charge. Go to the next row, activate and pre-charge. This has to be done periodically such that the charges that is stored in the capacitors of the appropriate rows are not decayed. So memory controller needs to read each row periodically to restore the charge. So activate, pre-charge each row at every n millisecond, where n is typically the refresh interval. So this is refresh interval of 64 millisecond means in every 64 millisecond, a DRAM cell has to be refreshed. That means contents has to be transferred into the row buffer and then store it back. And this has its own implications on performance, meaning when the DRAM is in the refresh operation, then it is not available for outside request. DRAM bank is unavailable during the refreshing operation. So during refreshing, it takes some amount of time to refresh all the rows. So you have long pause times. If you refresh all rows in a burst, at every 64 millisecond, DRAM will be unavailable to capture the request. So refreshing is basically an operation in which an entire row is transferred to row buffer and then it is stored back. Once you store it back, all the capacitors are properly charged representing whatever data you wanted to store in. But since you have so many rows, all the rows has to be taken one after another and during this refreshing operation, DRAM is not available for outside request. So we experience a pause, DRAM will service request, then it goes for this internal mechanism of refreshing during that time, no other requests are entertained. So DRAM won't be available for some time during which the request happens. Again, it is available. Again, for a shorter time, it is not available. So DRAM refresh are of two types. First one is called burst refresh. All rows are refreshed immediately, one after another. Take one row, refresh it. Take another row, refresh it. Do it for all the rows, and then DRAM is opened for others. Again, after some time, again, you move, move into the refresh one. The other one is called distributed refresh. Each row is refreshed at a different time. So you take up the first row, refresh. Then DRAM is open for normal read-write operation. After some time, you go and refresh second row. So the pause time is very less. Each has its own merits and demerits. Distributed refresh eliminate long pause times. So you can see from this graph, if it is a burst request, let us say these are the rows. Each row is refreshed. and this much is the time by which the row has to be refreshed again. So during this time, from this point to this point, DRAM is available. 
Once the time period is over, you have to refresh all the rows again. So, you have a burst of refreshing that happens. Let us say there are 10 rows. Now, in this new case, all these 10 rows will be refreshed, not like in a bursty mode. You refresh only one row at a time, remaining time DRAM is available. Here also DRAM is available. This is called scattered refresh, but we can see that whenever the refreshing is in progress, DRAM cannot service the data accordingly. So, burst refresh and the distributed refresh are the two mechanisms by which refreshing happens inside DRAM. So, with this we come to the end of uh, this DRAM structures. So, just to summarize what we learned today, we were trying to see how address mapping is done because we know that DRAM consists of channels, DIMMs, ranks, banks, rows and columns. So, given an address, which bit will represent the rank, which bit will represent the bank, which is for rows and columns. And we have seen there are different types of interleavings. And basically, your banking is going to help in parallelizing things. So, where should be the bank bits coming? Raw interleaving and you have cash block interleaving. And then we have seen when there is multiple channels, where will be the channel bits be? Adjacent words can be in adjacent channels. Adjacent words, uh, when it goes to adjacent channels, so word number 1 you fetch from one channel, word number 2 you fetch from another channel like that. Similarly, adjacent columns, adjacent rows, adjacent banks can be in adjacent channels. Moving further, we have seen what is the role of operating system when it gives a physical address for a physical frame to a virtual address that has an implicit control over what is the bank that you are going to give. We have learned the functions of DRAM controller, what it does, the DRAM scheduling policies and then we concluded today's discussion with the refreshing operation of DRAM. So, with this we complete 10 lectures of the course. The course is divided into storage aspect and the interconnect aspect. Now, our pipelining aspect is covered, our cache memory aspect is covered, our main memory aspect is covered. And now, we are fit to learn, try to understand what is multi-core and how the storage mechanisms what we have learned is going to help in improving the performance of a multi-core processor. I hope you are enjoying this course. We are almost half done another 10 lectures more. Feel free to contact us if you have any queries. Thank you very much.